Welcome to episode 60 of the Serious About Security podcast for October 17, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Serious, at Purdue University. I'm joined today by Keith Watson, and Mike Hill is out this week. He should be back next week, if all goes well. Um, I'm Preston Wiley. And uh, we have two articles today, as usual. Um, the first one is mine, and uh, I'm talking about an attempt uh, by uh, security researchers to audit the TrueCrypt uh, uh, program, essentially. Uh, TrueCrypt is, we've talked about it quite a few times on previous podcasts. It's a program that allows you to create encrypted volumes, um, on your computer using various uh, encryption algorithms. You can encrypt volumes in, I, on Windows, I don't know, um, on various computers you can create, encrypt your system volume. Um, and you can do quite a few things with TrueCrypt and it's considered one of the prime examples of open, uh, freely available um, encryption that you can probably get. I don't, I don't know of anything that really that compares as far as free software goes in terms of full disk encryption. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's there's some quite. I mean, after the NSA uh, thing and all the all the uh, revelations that have come out of that, um, people don't know what to trust anymore. And and this is an attempt to kind of answer some questions uh, about TrueCrypt on is it is it secure? Because uh, there's there are some questions on TrueCrypt like who wrote it. The, the authors of TrueCrypt decided to remain anonymous, and so there's questions on who wrote it, and if you don't know who the author is, it's kind of hard to trust a piece of software just, just on given given that. It is, it is, the source is open, so it can be audited, um, but no one has audited it, and, uh, and there's also questions, I guess, about the license of, of TrueCrypt, and that it's kind of written in a, in a strange, unusual way and uh, there, there's things about auditing that. So um, they have a, I don't remember what system they use, but their Indiegogo system, they, they want to raise $25,000 and I guess they're already up to uh, 21,273 mm -hmm. as of this podcast. Yep. So they're close. They're they're close. Symphony, they they less. Yeah. So, so this, <coughs> this may happen. So their their goals, according to their them, is to do a uh, license review, uh, implement reproducible builds. There's also questions about about uh, about that. Um, pay pay out some bug bounties and uh, conduct a professional audit. I'm not sure if they can do all that with twenty five thousand dollars. I don't know if they have some other money coming from somewhere else, but that doesn't seem like enough to do to and and all those and I'm paying out big bucks for that right. bug bounty. But I don't know what their idea of a bug bounty is if it's a hundred dollars or if it's I mean I guess Microsoft just paid out a hundred thousand dollars for a bug bounty and that beat just recently. So all of the budget so so <clears throat> I thought this was interesting, um, especially with all the revelations that have that have come up with the NSA and all that. So I wanted to put this out there for discussion. I agree, this is very interesting, um, especially given the fact that the NSA, as part of their program, through the leaks of Edward Snowden, we discovered they're out to subvert various free, open source, even commercial products. And so we hope that TrueCrypt is not one of those that, that has been subverted in any way. Um, and even auditing may not reveal that um, if they are subtle enough in the way if, again, this is all speculation, if they were subtle enough to introduce some backdoors into TrueCrypt, they might be difficult to find. However, hopefully given enough eyes and enough eyes that understand cryptography specifically, uh, maybe that could be discovered and corrected if it's actually there. Don't know that it is, not gonna speculate that it is, but that's the thought, right? There's also an issue with just having bugs in general. Bugs that could be used as, because they weaken the algorithm of the software in some way, and those bugs could be used as a way, as a backdoor by uh, government agencies, most likely to try to figure out uh, you know, keys that were used or just weaknesses in the algorithm that allow them to do a variety of uh, 
uh, attacks against the encrypted data. So this is all good news. Um, but what was interesting is, is you know, they're doing a license review. And I understand why, because TrueCrypt does use a very weird, not quite potentially problematic free open source tile license. So that definitely should be done. Um, it's kind of odd that it's part of this, this whole audit process, but hey, if you can get it done, great. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot to take a look at with TrueCrypt. And while TrueCrypt is certainly one of those open source tools that we want to get audited, there are others. And um, the other one that I'm worried more about is probably OpenSSL. Because while TrueCrypt is a software package specifically for Windows, Mac, and Linux, OpenSSL runs on everything. And it's a library that's used in commercial and free and open source software projects. And so I'd like to see something similar for OpenSSL as well. There are some differences. Obviously, there, the licensing for that is definitely open source. The OpenSSL library has been um, work, the work has been done by, by known individuals, and a lot of them are cryptographers by, uh, by career. So there's a little less to worry about, perhaps, with yeah, OpenSSL. It also and uses an open standard as well. Yes, so. it's built to some open standards. The other problem with, with it is bugs pop up all the time in OpenSSL and those get reported and fixed, but still, it would be great to have that one audited as well. So, hint, hint, for anybody out there looking for another project it's in a similar nature. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it seems like they're going to reach their goal. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking oh, yeah. with Less how, far they've, how far they've gotten already. they've gotten already. I think they've had it in 60 days, maybe a 60 day, and day two, they're almost there. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, I don't know if they have any stretch goals or anything like that, like some of these projects have that they want to do if, if they exceed their goal. I, I have no idea. But um, I think <coughs> auditing can never be bad. I mean, it can't be a bad thing. Right. So, um, and TrueCrypt, we've talked about it a lot. I use it. I'm sure mm -hmm. you use yep. it. A lot of people, a lot of security people I know use it. And um, and it would be nice to just kind of be, be, be given the rubber stamp that yeah it's okay exactly and that, I think it helps that the person leading the charge here is is Professor Matthew Green at John Hopkins and, and this guy's well known uh, cryptographer and professor and so I think I I feel more confident with an academic kind of leading the charge someone who's actually worked in the field for a while. So, uh, you know, he, he's also been an outspoken critic of a lot of the NSA revelations. So, I think he's kind of the right guy to, to lead the charge here as well. And he's also not saying there's necessarily anything oh, yeah. wrong with it. It's just to verify. This is just, that a, good, right? this is just a, we don't know what to trust anymore kind of mentality because, you know, there's been a lot of things that we never would have expected to happen, yes. um, that have happened. And, you know, this is just, this, make sure we can trust the tool that we're using. Yep. So, good good work going on there. Everybody should go give them a few bucks. And, and a, a simple website is truecryptauditedyet.com. Yes. You can go Got there. following the is. And right now it says no. no. Hopefully someday. Sometimes they'll say yes. Exactly. So, and they have links to their, uh, to their, uh, their funding site. So, the Indiegogo site. Um, that you can donate money to if you're interested. I guess 20000 I think, for the 20000 a significant amount came from one person. It was 10000 10000 came security from one, security one, in, one security firm. So uh, maybe, maybe uh, more came from that. And if you donate enough, you get a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, the next article is related to some ransomware that's been going around lately. And this one is, we've talked about ransomware before. This one is particularly uh, menacing. And, and there are variants going around which are not always caught by your anti-malware software. 
And in fact, we had this issue. Um, this one in particular is called CryptoLocker. And CryptoLocker is ransomware that scrambles files on your computer um, and then they claim encrypt them. It sends the key up to a server somewhere out on the internet and then issues a, basically a warning page that says your personal files are encrypted. And it gives you roughly 72 hours to pay $300 to then decrypt these files. So, so we ran into this issue with some users that received an email that contained an attachment and the email was fairly convincing about uh, having a, an attached form for um, basically uh, using your personal vehicle for in-state business. And so we had a variety of people to question whether it was legitimate or not and actually saved the attachment and then opened it. Sadly, that was not the right thing to do because then this then triggers and goes and encrypts a bunch of files. And the problem that we ran into specifically were, were that people uh, had this malware take off and encrypted files on the local machine and on mounted file shares. So even their home directory was messed up, but also any other share they had mounted for departments and those sorts of things, those files were also affected. And basically any other user would just see corrupted data and couldn't actually open files. So uh, it's, it was pretty problematic, mostly because our original software didn't detect it. So we had to extract it from a machine that had been compromised and then uh, feed that up to the vendor so that they could create a signature for it. And then we started pushing policy out to make sure we got it caught where we could. This one, um, probably the biggest problem we ran into were just trying to recover from it. We were able to detect it in most cases after we got uh, a new DAT file from the vendor. But the particular issues we ran into were trying to figure out who had these encrypted files and what file shares were affected by it because it's not, it wasn't always easy to know what volumes had been mounted at the time the malware took off. So uh, looking through the storage server trying to find all these has been problematic. But uh, the, the issue is, I don't, we didn't certainly pay any $300 to get files back, but I'm sure there are some people that may have. Um, my question would be, did they actually decrypt their files or, or did they just pay out 300 bucks and still have to go back to backups? So. Well, according to the uh, article posted, there has been word that it does actually decrypt your files. Oh, well, that's you pay there, I guess. If you of course, there's no support if it fails. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, so we haven't paid out, obviously. We've been going to backups right, and restoring or, or using um, snapshots from the storage array to go back previously. And, and according to this article, you can also use shadow copies right. of files that were created previously on Windows to restore those files as well. Right. Uh, Which is so somewhat of a backup. Right. right, so you have those enabled, that's one way. But those are, to those are not, you don't have certainty that, that that would work. So, and it doesn't seem to mess with any system files either. So, no. like system restore or something like that wouldn't work either because it just deals with system files. Right. <coughs> so, it's pretty nasty stuff. Um, so, you definitely don't want to get it. The other problem is there are some variants floating around, and so your, your malware may not, or your anti malware software may not detect it. So. So what do you do? So there's a couple of things. One is always, as always, make sure you have good backups because this is a case where you can pay the $300 and maybe get your files back. Or you can just restore from backup and, and be back up and running. Um, the other issue is this was a pretty convincing email. In fact, we had an email chain of business managers forwarding the malware around to different departments trying to figure out if the form attached was actually legitimate or not. Um, so there's a lot of fairly convincing text in the message that people received enough that they were uh, curious enough to see if it was legitimate or not. So that, uh, as always, you know, don't click on just random attachments from people that show up. But also make sure your, your antivirus uh, software is up to date. In our case, it was up to date, but it still didn't catch it because there was a variant that they didn't detect at that time. We went to virus total 
and plugged it in there, and only six out of the 30 some odd vendors there actually detected the variant we had. So it's one of those things that they had not caught up to what was currently out in the field at that time. Well, there's some interesting information in the article, the bleeping computer article. Apparently, if you know that you are infected and you remove the network connection, it will no longer encrypt your files. Apparently, the private key or something is stored remotely, and if you remove the network connection, it no longer has access to the key for encrypting your files. I guess they don't want to store the key locally because then you might be able to get it. Sure. So, interesting. And also, one, I guess, disturbing thing that I see in the article is you shouldn't remove the app data folder that has this crypto locker until you've decided you don't want to pay the ransom. Yes. I don't think you should ever pay the ransom. Probably just encourages this sort of thing. Exactly. So, but even if they get just a very small percentage of people to pay the right bucks, they still make a lot of money. It's like spam, right? Just that small percentage that actually click on it. Yeah, which is unfortunate, but I would not advise ever to pay the ransom just because, you know, you don't know, you don't know if you're actually getting your files back. Yeah, you don't know if you're getting your files back, and you don't know if they're actually removing the, any, completely removing malware from your computer. They might just be labeled sucker. Right. And then, you know, maybe at three months down the line, oh, look, your files are encrypted again. Oh, no, let's go, let's try and get more money out of you. Exactly. So, so this is particularly malicious stuff. It's it's nasty. The cleanup process, if, unless you have backups, is pretty tough. Um, so you gotta watch out for these things. Um, there are some suggestions on blocking executables that run in certain directories that are you know tied to these types of malware. Um, so that's something we're investigating as well. Yeah, so so apparently, things you can do via group policy to block. Right, you can prevent execution of executables inside the app data directory I think and it's, uh, several other directories, which I think is a good way to go. It's a good way to go. We're not sure. Our issue is, you know, what applications, legitimate applications, we have that might be affected by. Right. There are there are some things that do run in the app data folder that exactly you would want to run, like I think maybe the Google some Google stuff. Right, so that might break a few things. Like when you download a file and you run it right. locally, I think it might put it in the app data folder. Exactly. Like so, so we were still investigating if that's a viable solution. But it's pretty nasty stuff. It kept us up late one night trying to correct it and uh, kept us busy, unfortunately, working on that instead of all the other stuff we needed to do. So yeah, ransomware has a quite a history. It's been going around for a while. This one seems seems like a fairly robust and well-designed yes, piece, of, piece of <laughs> ransomware. Apparently, if you enter a wrong, the, 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 an invalid payment code uh, in, the, uh, in the box, it decreases your timer. So it's, oh, like, right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like if you try and defuse the bomb and you fail yes. the timer, the timer drops and it goes in half or something like exactly. that. So, so they've, uh, they've uh, tried to prevent you from subverting it or, or trying to break into it or, or, what, or whatever yeah. and, and uh, they, I, I hate, hate to think how much money they're getting from it. Oh yeah, uh, the other interesting thing, if I'm trying to find a reference to it, but I believe that it's, they have fairly flexible payment terms, including they will accept Bitcoins. <laughs> yes. The other thing is that I see here is uh, <laughs> they will accept, it says you need to pay $300, 300 euros, or a similar amount of another currency. So, I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean 300? Something equivalent to $300, okay. perhaps, I guess. Because I, I don't know what they exchange several, rate. It's several thousand yen or something like that. I was like, I'll pay. 300 of a, some low, low value currency. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that would work. Don't want to pay 300 Bitcoin. 300 yen, yeah. perhaps, or something. Yeah, 300 yen. Yeah. Well. There you go. So, do you think you have this under control? Mm -hmm. uh, we have this variant of it under control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
what, what happens with the, with the next variant, I suppose? Well, we're trying to put stuff in place. That I, mean, I mean, the other thing is, in order to get infected, it required a pretty decent fishing attempt as well. Yes, and so it was pretty successful in that respect. So there's, there's two things that had to happen, I guess. You had to have the malware, and then you had to have the vector for the right infection, which would be the yes. phishing email mm-hmm. or, or whatever. So, or a vulnerability in a web browser or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, in this particular case, it was a well-crafted phishing email with a nice attachment that looked legitimate, and a lot of people fell for it. Okay. Yeah. Was it a PDF or a zip file or a uh, zip? <laughs> that's, that's harsh. Yep. I, I would like to think people have learned how to no, have the problems, but I guess not. Nope. Okay, well, I guess keep an eye out for that. Don't open zip files. Or don't open any emails. Yes, it's for people you don't know. And even if you do know them and it looks questionable, call them. <laughs> yes. Or email them back or, or, or whatever. Verify before you open any attachments. So, anything else to say? No, I think we've covered it. All right. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm Preston Wiley. Uh, have a safe and secure day.